next speaker, we are uh, pleased to have Dr. Beth Harrison with us. She is a um, lovely pathologist from our Brigham Women's Hospital, and she is going to talk about why do some lesions require surgery and others do not. So I will stop sharing my screen. So uh, Dr. Harrison, please share your screen with us. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Beth Harrison, and I'm one of the breast pathologists here at the Brigham, and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Um, and I'll be discussing why some lesions require surgery and others do not, and with a focus on these high-risk lesions. So in the last few decades with widespread screening mammography, um, we have seen not only earlier detection of breast cancer, but also an increased detection of benign breast disease. So uh, approximately 10% of patients will have a finding on um, screening mammogram that prompts a breast needle biopsy. And of those biopsies, 20% um, will be cancerous while approximately 80% are benign. And not all benign disease is created equal. Um, some of it may need to be excised. So a woman, a woman may need to undergo an image-guided breast needle biopsy if the radiologist sees a lesion such as a mass or calcifications on imaging. With a mass, the concern might be that one could find an invasive cancer, but there are also um, common benign lesions like fibroadenomas that could account for a mass or a nodule. Um, with Calcifications, the concern is for ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a pre-invasive uh, cancer of the breast that is associated with calcifications. But again, there are several common benign lesions that can be associated with calcifications. And um, it's these biopsies for calcifications that have really sort of uncovered a lot of um, the benign breast disease that we see today. Now, woman, when a woman undergoes a biopsy, the tissue, gets, the tissue gets sent to pathology for processing. Um, the tissue cores are embedded in paraffin, which is like a wax. Um, the tissue is then cut onto slides and stained, and then we can look at it under the microscope and make a diagnosis. And so this is a kind of a typical breast pathology report for a breast biopsy. And it's a long list of complicated medical terminology. And I can imagine that this is somewhat anxiety inducing as a patient. Um, and you know, if I were a patient, I might run to Google and look it up. And, and actually, all of the lesions listed here are benign. Um, so how do you make sense of your pathology report as a patient? You know, I think it's um, kind of nice to have a framework and some big categories to place these lesions in. You know, is it normal breast tissue? Is, are they benign or atypical lesions or is there cancer? And we can place you know, the diagnoses into these various bins. Um, with normal at one end of the spectrum and cancer at the other. And by bre with breast cancer, um, we include both invasive uh, cancer as well as ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a pre-invasive cancer. Now, pathology lesions that are not cancer kind of fall into this big umbrella of benign breast disease, but you can divide that into you know, truly benign lesions and then these atypical lesions, um, which is where the high risk lesions um, kind of can be categorized. So atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, as well as lobular carcinoma in situ. And in the past, you might be able to draw a line through this diagram and say, well, everything on the right side, the cancer, anything atypical needs to be excised. But with evidence that we've gathered over recent years, um, it's, this has become less certain. And actually, it's beginning to look like maybe some of these lesions can be managed more conservatively. So in order to, so we're going to focus on these atypical lesions. And in order to kind of understand these lesions you, and their place and how normal breast can become cancerous, you first kind of have to understand normal and then the steps of progression. So a normal breast um, is composed of the milk ducts um, and those ducts branch and eventually terminate in 
lobules or the terminal duct lobular units. And the lobules are where um, there are glands that produce milk when a woman is lactating. And basically the ducts are the pipes, the plumbing that brings the milk to the nipple when a woman is breastfeeding. Um, and it's this terminal duct lobular unit or the lobule where a lot of the, the breast disease arises from. And so how does normal breast become cancer? Um, well, there are a number of steps in between. And so basically something happens for the cells to become abnormal. There are genetic changes that take place that give the cells a growth advantage and the cells um, begin to grow and to fill um, the, the duct. And when this happens, this is referred to as atypical hyperplasia. Then the cells continue to, to grow, continue to, to fill the ductal and lobular system. They may accumulate other abnormalities and at some point they're considered an in situ cancer, carcinoma in situ. And this is basically a pre-invasive cancer. The cancer cells are contained within the duct. When the cancer cells break free of the duct and invade into the surrounding tissue, that's considered invasive cancer. And it's invasive cancer that has the potential for the cells to get into the bloodstream or into the lymphatics and to spread to other sites in the body, which is what we're most concerned about. That's what can put the patient at, at greatest harm. So when we look um, at those atypical lesions um, in the progression to breast cancer, those atypical lesions can be considered precancerous lesions or precursor lesions. And there's um, a family of low grade, they belong to a family of low grade um, estrogen receptor positive lesions. So by low grade, the cells are, they have subtle abnormalities. And Estrogen receptor positive means that they're, they're responsive to estrogenic stimulation that may be produced by a woman's body. Um, these lesions often coexist within the breast and they share similar genetic abnormalities. So the pathways can be divided into the ductal and lobular pathways. And in the ductal pathway, the earliest recognizable lesion for us under the microscope is flat epithelial atypia or FEA. And in that lesion, the abnormal cells um, basically surround the periphery of the involved duct. And then FEA can give rise to ADH, and then ADH can give rise to DCIS, and then on to invasive cancer. Um, the cells of FEA, when they start to fill the duct, that's when we consider it um, ADH. And when two ducts or are involved, um, then we could make a diagnosis of DCIS. So DCIS can, a diagnosis of DCIS can be based on a very small um, uh, lesion. Now, uh, in the lobular pathway, the cells are actually very similar on a, gen in a genetic level, um, but they do have one hallmark and that's the loss of e cadherin, which is a protein on the cell surface. And e cadherin is like the glue that helps the cells to stick together. And without it, the cells look like they're kind of falling apart. And that's what we can see under the microscope. Um, and the earliest precursor lesion in this pathway is atypical lobular hyperplasia when the cells start to fill the lobule or when the cells can be recognized within the lobule. When the cells start to fill the glands within the lobule uh, and, and expand those glands, the lesion is big enough for us to call it lobular carcinoma in situ. And then when those cells break free and invade into the surrounding tissue, the most common type of cancer is an invasive lobular carcinoma. Now only a small set of, subset of these lesions will progress to cancer and the more advanced lesions are associated with higher risk. And so when we think of risk of um, breast cancer, we think of two different things. We think first of lesions that indicate an increased risk of breast cancer over a woman's lifetime, and then also lesions that have a significant risk of coexisting cancer in the surrounding tissue at the time of diagnosis. So lesions that we see on biopsy, what's their risk that we find cancer in excised tissue? 
Now, when we look at the risk of future breast cancer, you can see that there's increasing risk as you progress from benign to a typical hyperplasia to lobular carcinoma in situ and ductal carcinoma in situ. The lesions that are considered high risk, the ADH and the ALH, um, they increase a woman's risk of subsequently developing breast cancer by four to five fold in comparison to the, the general population. And this translates to an absolute risk over a woman's lifetime of about 15%. Um, for LCIS, the risk is even higher. It's eight to 10 fold versus the general population. And a uh, woman has a 20 to you know, 25 to 30 percent risk of subsequently developing breast cancer with LCIS. The risk is to both breasts. So these are risk indicators. Um, and it's not really the driving force behind why we want to excise these lesions, but it is one of the reasons why women are offered um, things like chemo prevention with, with endocrine agents. The real um, risk that uh, influences our decision as to whether to excise the lesion is the risk of finding cancer at surgical excision. So risk of finding coexistent cancer. We refer to this as the risk of upgrading to cancer. And certain lesions diagnosed on a needle biopsy are associated with a significant risk of finding cancer at excision. And by cancer, I mean both invasive cancer or DCIS. And the reason for this is that needle biopsies are limited. Um, they sample only a portion of the lesion. We're only looking at a portion of the lesion under the microscope. Um, there's even a small chance that the lesion might not be sampled at all. The tissue can be scant or very fragmented, which can make a uh, definitive diagnosis challenging. Um, and so because of these issues with sampling, it is really important um, for us to perform something called radiologic pathologic correlation to ensure that the lesion has been sampled. And, and so we ask ourselves, does the lesion, does what we see under the microscope explain the radiologic findings? If we see a mass, could this potentially explain a mass lesion? If we see calx, do we see calcifications under the microscope? Is it concordant? Or does, do the pathologic findings not explain um, what, what they're seeing on radiology and is it discordant? And basically surgical excision is recommended for lesions that either have a high risk of coexistent cancer or that have discordant findings. And so let's look at each of the high risk lesions individually. So atypical ductal hyperplasia is typically seen on biopsies for calcifications. Um, again, its distinction from low grade DCIS relies on extent. So that sampling could become an issue. If you only sample a portion of the lesion, you may not see more of it that's in the adjacent tissue. And when you surgically excise a lesion and you get a chance to look at the surrounding tissue, um, it might be that you see enough to make that diagnosis of DCIS. Um, so that's really the biggest risk, is risk of upgrade to DCIS. Although the overall risk of finding cancer at excision is approximately 10 to 30%, and that overall risk is sufficiently high that surgical excision is the standard of care for atypical ductal hyperplasia. For atypical lobular hyperplasia and lobular carcinoma in situ, um, these lesions are often kind of considered together. Um, they are incidental lesions um, found on biopsies for um, other reasons. They're not usually the target. They're not usually associated with, with calcifications. They don't usually form mass lesions. Um, so on, um, on several studies in the literature, there have been variable upgrade rates to cancer um, on excision ranging from anywhere from zero to 50%. And a lot of these studies are limited um, by radiologic pathologic correlation, the older studies especially. Um, you could imagine that if the targeted lesion was a mass and the ALH or LCIS doesn't explain a mass, then um, really that's discordant. That's a discordant case and it perhaps should not be 
the ones that we're looking closely at when we make these decisions, th that type of case would be excised regardless. Um, recent studies that have better radiologic pathologic correlation have suggested that the risk of cancer at excision is actually under 5%. And this is sufficiently low where we can say that the, the surgical excision is probably not necessary if the biopsy findings are concordant, if the pathology otherwise explains the radiology um, and there are no other um, high-risk lesions present. One exception to this rule is pleomorphic LCIS, which is a form of LCIS that's high grade. And the, the cells are very abnormal in this lesion. Um, it's not like the other low grade precursor lesions that we've talked about. Um, the risk of upgrade to cancer at excision is 25 to 50% for these lesions. And so complete surgical excision is recommended. And, and historically it's been treated like DCIS. Um, it's a big question whether we should treat it like DCIS and, and obtain negative margins and also potentially treat patients with radiation. And the research is ongoing in regards to that question. And finally, um, the last of the atypical lesions is the flat epithelial atypia, which is that earliest precursor lesion. Um, recent studies suggest that the risk of cancer for this lesion is about 5% and less than 1% of all of the calcifications that are seen on imaging have been re removed by the biopsy. And so it's, it's a bit controversial and institution dependent, but it's thought that routine surgical excision is not necessary for these lesions. So in summary, um, ADH, ALH, and LCIS are high-risk lesions that increase a woman's risk of developing breast cancer over her lifetime. And while women should undergo surgical excision of ADH due to the risk of finding cancer, recent studies suggest surgical excision may be avoided for many women with ALH and LCIS and FEA. And overall, this kind of matches our current trends in practice, which favor less surgery for breast disease. So that's it, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, that was a wonderful overview. Um, can you stop sharing your screen for a moment? Oh, sure. Uh, we do have, there have been some questions uh, in the chat. Uh, we've tried to answer uh, some of them as, as you've gone along. I do want to, yes, remind everyone that the entire forum uh, will be posted on the website so you can review uh, these videos at your um, leisure. Um, one of the things I just want to make sure that um, everyone is, is clear from Dr. Harrison's uh, presentation is that when you have a lesion such as atypical duct hyperplasia, we recommend the surgical excision at the time, right after your diagnosis or shortly after your diagnosis to make sure that you don't have an associated cancer at that time. And with the different lesions, there's a different risk of finding a cancer. So one of the questions that came in was specifically about atypical duct hyperplasia. So when we perform a surgical excision for ADH, there's about a 15 to 20% chance that we will find cancer at the time of that surgery, which means that most women, 75 to 80% of women with a core biopsy diagnosis of ADH will in fact not have cancer. But once we've ruled that out, then we do again help women understand the future risk of breast cancer associated with those changes. So the future risk associated with ADH or ALH, and that future risk is very steady over a woman's lifetime. And you can consider it at approximately 1% per year, which means that each year you come in for your mammogram, there's a 99% chance you won't be diagnosed with breast cancer and a 1% chance that you will. Or over your lifetime, the risk associated with those atypical lesions is about 15 to 20%. So again, most women with these lesions, even though they are at elevated risk, most women will not uh, develop breast cancer. And we thank Dr. Harrison and her colleagues for helping us to sort this out on these little pieces of core biopsy tissue that they are often asked to look at. I frequently joke with some of my patients that it's sort of like having the pieces to a puzzle, but not having the, the cover of the box to know what those pieces are supposed to make. So is this a tree or is this a cow? And sometimes they do need more tissue uh, to help make that definitive uh, diagnosis for us.
so sometimes that's why we might have an excision recommended as well, is just because they can't be 100% sure what they're looking at. <laughs> 